Yes. Yes. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Fourth of July. I love my Fourth of July talk because it marries up all my hats. It marries up all my little hats because I get to talk about our founding. I get to talk about our our founding principles. It's got the minister, the lawyer, the veteran. It's got everything. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, because you come at it with whoever you are. So this is perfect. So today we are going to, or Wednesday, we celebrate the 4th of July, our nation's independence. So what I want to do today is talk about freedom, kind of a new way of looking at that freedom, a new way of looking at freedom, and it's also an old way of looking at that freedom. We're going to take a different look than folks normally do on Independence Day. As I researched this topic, I found lessons that we can learn about ourselves and about our lives and about our community from our founders and the principles that they believed in and the principles that they fought and lived for and thought about enough to risk their fortunes and their very lives. Despite, despite their flaws and their limitations and their prejudices, of which they had many, they did an amazing thing, a brave and an inspirational and a wonderful thing. Okay, so starting off, because we're us, you know I love trivia. And so I'm going to give us a little bit of Independence Day trivia because it's a tradition. I love trivia. When our founders signed the Declaration of Independence, affirming for themselves and posterity the rights of all men, and yes, back then it was all men, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, think about this, it was the first time that those principles had ever been articulated in any document of civic government. It was the first time that anybody had written down that those were the values, those were the principles that we were going to fashion our nature, our nation from. The first time that such a vision had been stated as the basis of the life of a nation. The drafter of our Declaration, Thomas Jefferson, as we've said before, was a devoted student of the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. He was a student of John Locke, who was one of the first who articulated the philosophy that each individual, each person, had the right to life, liberty, and property. The natural right, not given by kings or authorities, given from God, as they called it, from spirit. It is said that in the Declaration it was Jefferson's genius and his vision that after reading Locke, he substituted the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, for what Locke had as the pursuit of property. Isn't that cool? He substituted the pursuit of happiness because he said the new nation was too big, the new idea was too big, the vision was too big to limit it to the mere acquisition of property. It was way bigger than that. Given our focus these days on profits, on the sanctity of capital, on the importance of corporations, of the way we run our business world, sometimes I think it makes sense to go back and take another look at Jefferson's distinction about why he did what he did, putting the pursuit of happiness for all in the community above the pursuit of property. It was a profoundly revolutionary idea that common people, just us, not kings, not nobles, not clergy, but every, everyday people had those God-given natural rights. The Declaration of Independence was a declaration of the dignity and the value of each person as much as it was a love song to this new nation. It was an amazing document. People didn't live to serve the king, the state, the church. Enlightenment philosophers said it was exactly the other way around. Authority rose up. Government arose from the consent of the governed. All of us. Next time you see a yard sign, you know, vote for Joe Schmo, think about that. That is the source of our civic authority, which was an amazingly revolutionary thought. As a later statesman wrote, government of the people, by the people, for the people, was our basis. So, admittedly, the founders had a very limited idea of who the people were, the people. It was men, it was white men, right? It was property owners, and for the longest time those prejudices existed. They excluded women, African Americans, and as the years progressed, other minorities. Our founders were men of their times, and while they had amazing vision in some particulars, they were also limited by their prejudice and their culture and their judgments 
in many other ways. And over the years, it has been our national challenge to fix those injustices and widen the circle so that the vision applies to everybody equally. When I was in Navy boot camp years and years ago, and we won't go that far, I was put up for a recruit award that required an interview on what made the United States exceptional. Right? The question was, what makes us different? What makes the United States exceptional? Fortunately, the good news was I had just read an editorial in the paper, going, and so I knew, I knew I had a perfect answer going to prove again that timing is everything. Anyway, the answer I gave was that we were exceptional and different because we were a country that was founded not on location but on principle. Right? If you're French, or if you're German or English, you're French or German or English because your ancestors were Franks or Celts or whomever wandering around that geographic bit of dirt, right? That's why you're that, that's why you're that nationality. The French love and defend France because it's always been France. They were born there, I mean, that's where they're from. Their allegiance is to the, the country, not to the principles. We love our land, certainly, but that's not the basis we were founded on. We're a nation of articulated, written principles of freedom, equality, opportunity. That was entirely new. That was a huge thing. And it was a real experiment. I mean, think of the way in this community, One World, or any spiritual community, we live lives in which our principles make a difference. Right? We go out and we take our spiritual values and we make them alive beyond these very walls. That's what we did in a civic nature. Right? We said the principles matter. The principles are going to govern the way we live. The govern the way we live in community. No one knew how this venture would turn out. George Washington was wildly convinced he was not the right man for the job. He wrote lots of letters to Martha about this. I really can't do that except in much better language than that. They didn't know if it would work, and nobody could predict the shape of the government 50 years hence, 100 years hence, 37 years after the Constitution was signed, James Madison was writing somebody, and he was saying that already, 37 years after it was signed, the parameters of what they said had begun to be changed. The words were taking on new meaning, because our lives changed. It was a living document articulating that those principles while true, we're going to change in how they are applied, change in how they look, change in how they are shaped. Our founders believed in their principles and their vision, and they literally bet their farms on it. As Wendy Lusbader wrote, this is how freedom begins. We have to dare to venture beyond the familiar landmarks of identity in order to locate the next version of ourselves. And that is exactly what they did. They moved beyond the version of themselves that was there to create an entirely new vision. So there's more that I learned, but I love, I love this stuff. We hear a lot on July 4th about the pursuit of happiness, don't we? Okay, now we usually see it in ads, right? Go to Best Buy, it's time for the pursuit of happiness. Or get this, it's the pursuit of happiness. This will make you happy, that will make you happy. Just keep spending money. A phrase written by Thomas Jefferson into the Declaration. The phrase he wrote is familiar, and it is this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We often take the phrase pursuit of happiness to mean individual pleasures, right? Because we're a nation of individuals. We're like a nation of like the Marlboro Man, you know? Cowboys, independence. So the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of our individual pleasures individual fulfillment. You get out of my way because I have the right to my own pursuit of happiness, right? I, I have that right. It's written in the Declaration of Independence. However, history suggests that that is not the way he meant it. That is not what he meant, how we have taken it. We forget the phrase has a rich history. As Jefferson was a lover of Greek and Roman philosophy, back to Stoics. Yeah. <laughs> Good segue, huh? Okay, anyway. <laughs> His writing suggests this meaning to him was much broader, and I think his meaning has a lesson to us today. Jefferson got the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, from John Locke in a 1690 essay called Concerning Human Understanding. In it, Locke wrote that the necessity of pursuing happiness is the foundation of liberty. He went on to caution against mistaking imaginary for real happiness, 
saying that the pursuit of happiness led to our highest good. Think about that. These documents that shape a civic fabric are talking about happiness. As I read that, I also got a flash of the Dalai Lama. It just shows how these things all run together when he says the very purpose of our life is to seek happiness, right? That's what he says. That's, I mean, this man who has been through everything, the purpose of our life is to seek happiness. And here's John Locke in 1690 talking about the same thing. These universal truths span time and distance. The Dalai Lama didn't mean transitory pleasures, and neither did Jefferson or Locke. Jefferson took this notion of Locke's and expanded on it, drawing upon his understanding of Greek and Roman notions of civic virtue, right action, and the good life. He wrote that happiness was the aim of life, and virtue, a word we don't use a lot nowadays, but it's a great word, the foundation of happiness. But he didn't mean what we think. It's not a zero-sum equation. It's not like, I get my happiness, and that means it's less for you. It's, it's, that's not the way it is. It's not like a pie. Yeah. It's the exact opposite. That healthy community is a win-win for all. The pursuit of happiness is a communal pursuit. And only when everybody rises up can we have true union. Can we have true health and vitality in our civic fabric. The idea that Jefferson put into the Declaration was not that each of us has the right to as many iPhones as we can get, or that I have the right to as much money as I can get so I can purchase as much as I want, or that I can snatch my happiness at your expense. It was the opposite, that our communal happiness and thence our individual happiness comes from the exercise of the virtues that enable us to live well in community. Don't we find that here? Don't we find that our individual happiness is expanded and grounded by our ability to live well in community? From the exercise of the virtues that we bring to our associations together, peace, understanding, courage, compassion, integrity, our highest good on an individual and on a civic level comes from living out of our highest selves for the greater good of the whole community. That was the basis of this new nation. We don't really think about that now because we think, well, we all have this right, my right to this, my right to that. Get out of my way because I'm chasing my right. That's not the way it was designed. Those were not the principles that were written into our founding documents. If you can trace that thread, through our revolutionary era to its ending is that the founders knew that we were going to succeed or fail as a union. We were going to succeed or fail together as a national community. As Benjamin Franklin said, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly we will all hang separately. Right? Of course, he meant it literally. <laughs> but the truth still holds. So today we ask ourselves, we live in a very different world. When the Declaration of Independence was signed, there were like 2 million people living in the United States. How many are here now? Like 300 million more? I mean, I don't have the current number, but it's, 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 yeah. Say again? Yeah. I mean, it's a very different place. And we ask ourselves, what is community? Who is community? To use Benjamin Franklin's phrase, who is it that we are supposed to hang with? We find ourselves building walls. We find ourselves creating distinctions which diminish us, which weaken us. And it is a tough question when we ask ourselves nowadays, who is included, and if not, why not? The Stoic philosopher Hierocles gave us a way of thinking about the ties that connect us, which I really like. It's based on the Stoic idea of cosmopolitanism. Okay. When we think of cosmopolitan people today, what do we think of? Martinis. Martinis. We think of people who don't <laughs> eat chonies, right? We think of people who eat food that only ends with a vowel, right? Those are cosmopolitan people, but that's not the meaning of the word. The word cosmopolitan means citizen of the world. Cosmo meaning world, polites meaning citizen. That's what it meant. It means citizen of the world. Hierocles invited us to imagine ourselves in the center of what he called comprehending circles. Just think about this for a second. Circles within a circle, like Russian nesting dolls, right? Okay. So in the middle is yourself. In the middle little circle is yourself. In the next circle around that is your family, right? Your relatives. In the circle around that, and again, each outer circle includes the inner circles. 
The outer circle is your neighborhood, your friends, people you know. The next circle around that is going to be your city and your community. Again, everybody is comprehended within the inner circle. Next is your state. Next is your country. And the last circle is the whole world. Everybody, all of humankind. Whether, whether we ever have the opportunity to meet them, because obviously we won't, Hierocles suggested as an exercise that when we think of these people, people we have never met that we never will meet, we think of them as our brother and our sister. Think of that. Think of that within the context of today's political battles. If we were to take that paradigm and think, my brother on the border, my sister in prison, my brother being excluded, my sister living on the street. I mean, think of that. That's the way he urged us to think to raise up in us that image of connection which is the truth of who we are. Socrates said, never reply to anyone who asks your country, I am an Athenian or I am a Corinthian. Say, I am a citizen of the universe. This was Socrates, 300 BC. That's amazing. 2,000 years later, the consciousness of global community is gaining ground. Isn't that amazing? Why don't we ever read this stuff? <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess we can't read more than 140 characters, but even now we're thinking in terms now we're thinking in terms of global consciousness and global community. But the principles that apply to community on a small scale also apply to community on a larger scale, right? They may be harder to apply. The rules may be a little different. The application may be a little more challenging, but they still apply. The same principles that our founders articulated, that our peace and happiness are found in unity, in community, apply to these wider circles. There's no distinction. Our challenge today, and the new paradigm we have to build, is to take the values of community that we are going to celebrate next week and open them up to the wider circle. Open them up to those folks in the outer circles whom we have never met and we never will meet. To regard those whom we don't know, those whom we may disagree with, those whom we may not like as members of our own circle. Here at One World, in our spiritual practice, we know that we are connected, right? We know that we are all one. Well, that's the corollary because we can't take our spiritual principles and leave them in this room. Just like me, you all have many hats. I mean, when I walk out of this room and I'm a lawyer, I'm a veteran, I'm a minister, I'm a parent, I'm all these different things that we are. I take my same principles and I have to figure out how to apply them to all the facets of my life. And that's one thing that is such a gift about One World is because we encourage each other to do that. And holidays like this, like Independence Day, when we go out and set off firecrackers and celebrate who we are, help us to ask each other, who are we? What values are we bringing to this civic fabric? What values are we bringing to our global community? It's not an empty exercise. It's an important exercise. Now more than ever, we take these principles and we go out with them. And we know this can be done. Why? Because we've done it before. Look at what we did 250 years ago. We made something new, right? We took what was there and with a vision and grit and courage and action made something new, created a new paradigm of ourselves and gave the world a new vision for equality, justice, and prosperity. Did it always work? No. Do we sometimes fall on our face? Yes. But we are still a beacon for the rest of the world who want to live that life, who want to grab a hold of that promise. There's a reason these people are coming across the border. There's a reason people want to come here. It's because for them, no matter how broken we are, no matter how often we get it wrong, we are still a light for those values, and we should never forget it because it's a gift. Those are the values that I can celebrate on this Independence Day. As we face a future of greater interdependence, diminishing resources, increasing population, a shrinking globe, all the problems we face, the values of our founders, the vision that they had, that it can be better, still shine. And just as they did then, we can make something new. 
by using those same principles and applying it to our new vision of community. We can make something different and wonderful. We've done it before. We can open the doors of community to new meanings, new expressions, and new hope. Let's take that energy forward. And when we celebrate next week, let's not do it just in the energy of congratulations. Let's do it in the energy of challenge. Thank you.